We are going to be talking to law professor Sahar Aziz and writer and analyst Mitchell Plitnik about their new report, presumptively anti-Semitic Islamophobic Tropes in the Palestine-Israel Discourse. Thanks for having us. Yes, of thanks. Course. Good to be here. Thanks for coming. And I wanted to actually start off by asking you about your pers- well, your professional and if relevant p- personal backgrounds that brought you two to be working on this report in the first place. So I'm a professor at Rutgers University and also the director of the Center for Security, Race, and Rights. And the center is the first civil rights center at a U.S. law school that focuses primarily on the civil and human rights of Muslim, Arab, and South Asian communities. And I'm the founding director because I spent 15 years working on civil rights work related to Muslim, Arab, South Asians. And there were no institutions, academic centers specifically, that were working on these issues, and yet the discrimination was not decreasing uh, with time after 9-11. In fact, it had just become quite entrenched. And so what brings me to this issue is that both in my academic research and in my work with the center is we look at how international events and relations between the United States and Muslim-majority countries impact the stereotypes, the perceptions, the treatment or mistreatment of these diverse communities in the United States. And one cannot understand things such as Islamophobia or anti-Arab racism or anti-Palestinian racism if you don't understand what's happening in Palestine and and in Israel and the relationship that those two um, areas have with the United States. As you said, I'm I'm an analyst and a writer. Um, I'm president of a small a uh, nonprofit called Rethinking Foreign Policy. And I've been working on uh, Palestine and Israel for the past 20 plus years. And I uh, was uh, used, I was the founding co-director of Jewish Voice for Peace. I was the founding director of the US Office of B'Tselem. Um, and a couple of years ago, I co-authored a book with Mark Lamont Hill. Uh, it's called Except for Palestine, uh, The Limits of Progressive Politics. And this was how I met Sarah. Sahar, uh, because um, she was gracious enough to host an event with myself and Mark, and we got to talking, and I guess when she came up, this was really, this this report was her idea, and uh, when she came up with the idea, she approached me, and I just thought it sounded like a really exciting project, so we got to work on it, um, right. and here we are. Nice. Well, I guess just to add to, to that, the reason why the idea came to my mind is because Every time, uh, whether it was me or colleagues of mine in the academy or students or civil rights advocates, anytime they wanted to work on Palestinian human rights, which intrinsically involves having to analyze Israel's practices, oftentimes critique Israel's practices and policies. And every time they would do that, they would be called anti-Semitic and people would believe it. Um, not because they had done anything that was hateful towards Jews or that they had tried to intentionally discriminate against somebody who did. Okay, this is an Islamophobic trope and it really needs to be addressed. So you offer to be like a Jewish shield, uh, Mitchell. <laughs> um, I'm not sure being, uh, you know, coming from the background I do of uh, JBP and B'Tselem, uh, yeah, exactly, I'm not sure right. how much of a shield I provide to anyone, right. but I, I, I do think it's valuable uh, to anyone um to to you know i I think one of the things that 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 grounded this report in in such strength is that i do come at it from a jewish perspective sahar comes at it from a muslim and a perspective i come at it from um uh, coming from the nonprofit world sahar Sahar is an academic i mean i think we we brought a diversity of um background uh into it and i think that can only make it stronger and you when did this come out by the way November, the middle of November, 2023. So even though we've been working on it for over a year, it happened to also come out at the same time when many people who are critical of Israel and supportive of Palestinian human rights are being falsely accused of anti-Semitism. It came out just sort of fortuitously at a time when a lot of the things we were talking about in the report um, are coming to the surface with a vengeance, literally. Right. I have a lot of questions because the report is really good and I highly recommend it. I don't kind of larger macro question is so you your your report talks about the exceptional treatment afforded Israel by the United States. 
what is behind that exceptional treatment? Why does Israel treat the United States that way? I mean, this is um, obviously a bigger question than than our report. Um, there have been many books written on this, um, always controversial, and I think always, in my view, um, you know, even one book can't capture the the full answer to that question. And there's obviously a very long history of um, American support for Zionism and for the state of Israel. Uh, there's a lot of different reasons for it, and they've changed over time. There was a you know for for many many years it was a Cold War rationale that that drove uh, U.S. policy towards Israel. The Cold War ended, there needed to be a new rationale. And, and I think we, we argue actually that that, that rationale uh, became, uh, you know, this sort of clash of civilizations th thinking uh, that, you know, Samuel Huntington's book and, uh, you know, all of the, that was very, very popular just in the 90s and just when the Cold War was ending. It was a perfect sort of way to, to pick up that ideological thread that was hanging loose. Um, so I think there's a lot of that. Obviously, we know that there are also very powerful lobbying forces at work. Um, I think Jewish history has been badly uh, uh, sidetracked, I guess, or, or, or instrumentalized by this movement to justify some truly horrific things. Um, you're seeing that, in, again, in spades right now in a really, really big way uh, in Gaza. Um so I, I, there's there's a diversity of that, um, but it's I, it's it's usually characterized as love of Israel, support for Israel, you know, partnership with Israel. It's always focused on Israel, and what I think has not had enough attention uh, is is what we're focused on, which is the other side of that. Because in order to support Israel, uh, we see, for example, Joe Biden. Um, he, he stands up, I am a Zionist, I am, you know, I rock solid behind Israel. But what does that mean? It also means that for his entire term, long before October 7th, uh, he, he completely ignored and buried the entire issue of Palestine, did everything he could to, uh, to, to divert attention away from it and to actually, you know, to, to, to work with the Saudis to bypass the, the whole issue of Palestine. Uh, one can speculate as to whether or not that brought us right here. I think it did. Um, but, but we don't, just we generally don't pay enough attention to that other side, which is if you're talking about Zionism and how much you love Israel, you are also denigrating Palestinians and often taking that to an extreme, as Joe Biden has, questioning the, the number of Palestinian deaths, just basically buying every horrible, pernicious lie that Israel comes up with um, and, and never questioning anything that they say no matter how badly it feeds into these Islamophobic tropes that we discuss. So uh, we, we need to look at that other side. We need to think about, uh, it's not just that we love, you know, that our, our government loves Israel and supports Israel. It's that it is, it is either indifferent at best and very often um, opposed to uh, literally to Palestinian life. So, um, you know, where does that come from? How does that how does that part happen? That we I think there's a lot less academic literature on. And I think that's what we're trying to begin to address, at least with this report. Something that is so um, applicable to what we're seeing right now with these kind of academic witch hunts and censorship and demonization of terms like from the river to the sea and intifada. So you write um, a bastion of free speech, individual liberty and equality. Mm -hmm. This is the mantra our government repeats across the world and teaches nationwide in American schools. Rarely stated, however, are the varying limitations imposed on persons seeking to exercise such rights according to their identity. Protection of fundamental rights is at its zenith when exercised by white Judeo-Christian communities, while exceptions are frequently invoked when racial or ethnic minorities exercise the same rights to challenge policies and laws harmful to their communities. Members of the majority engaged in dissent are treated as patriots with different political views. Minorities who dissent are treated as security and cultural threats deserving of social stigma at best or criminalization at worst. This racialized double standard is most active, acute for Muslims or Arab Americans when they exercise their free speech right to cr criticize the US government's failure to hold Israel accountable for its systematic violations of Palestinians' human rights. So this is, again, something that we're seeing right now happening on campuses. 
And I wanted to actually um, ask you before I show you some examples of that, how does what's happening on campuses right now uh, relate to your report? So I wanted, I'm going to have to put a little pitch in for my book, The Racial Muslim, When Racism Quashes Religious Freedom, because I spent five years researching the very topic you just summarized. And to kind of expand on what Mitchell uh, stated, in order for Israel to effectively obtain the unconditional support of the U.S. government and a significant percentage of the U.S. population, it needs an Arab Muslim foil. Right? It needs to show, and it, it successfully does show, not because it's the truth, but because people in the U.S. have, have been uh, socially and politically primed to believe that Arabs are these savage people, right? And then Muslims are, uh, again, a, they, they present an existential threat to the Judeo-Christian uh, Western world. And that has been part of the narrative whether it's framed as Hamas or the PLO or Yasser Arafat or you know what a specific individual or Palestinians at large or Arabs at large, but there's always in order for Israel to be seen as effectively a Western outpost, a Western civilizational outpost, and part of global whiteness, which is privileged right in the global international order, it has to have a a threat, a brown threat, a Muslim threat. And the Palestinians represent that within that specific geographical space. And the farther back in time you go, you'll find that that used to include Egypt before the peace treaty. It used to include Syria and Lebanon and, and so on and so forth. So what you're seeing on campuses right now is a very specific and extreme example of one group of students being treated as if they are threats to the university, even though they are students who pay tuition, who attend class, who are have many of them are U.S. citizens, but when they dare to exercise their free speech rights in ways that effectively free speech rights are supposed to be exercised, which is to dissent, people in power or people who have the majority view or people who have mainstream views don't really need free speech rights because everything is normalized based on what they believe in. Free speech rights were, were established and religious freedom rights were established for minorities because the people, you know, the founders of the, and the drafters of the US Constitution understood from their own experiences with Britain is that the groups and the individuals and the communities most likely to be suppressed politically and repressed politically are going to be those who don't have mainstream views. And they're, they are the ones who need to be legally protected. And so what we're seeing is we're seeing anyone, well, first, first and foremost, right, Students for Justice in Palestine. And what I think is unique uh, to the to this time, 2023, is you also now have Jewish Voices for Peace yeah. and this new generation of, of Jewish Americans who are joining and allying with Palestinian, Muslim, and Arab uh, students. But ultimately, it's all being uh, portrayed, right, as this, this illiberal threat to anyone who is supportive of Israel and oftentimes essentializes uh, Jewish identity and Jewish right. politi politics within the diverse Jewish American communities, which in and of itself, I think is quite <laughs> perversely anti-Semitic.